first meeting of the House Judiciary Committee back to order. Uh, I would note present with us now are Representative Eastman, Representative Kopp, Representative Christ Tompkins, my Vice Chair, Representative Fansler, and Representative Millett. Uh, it is now 10.53 a.m., and we are shortly going to take up amendments, but I remembered that one of the topics that I had actually asked the Department of Law to come and provide comment on is the, in the Criminal Justice Commission report in the appendix, I think it's appendix F2 or F, there's a number of recommendations that, that were included and I had asked the Department of Law yesterday to provide their position or explain the status of those recommendations. So I believe Mr. Skidmore, the head of the Criminal Division is available to come and testify as to those and then any follow-up questions to that? Limit it to a minute. Questions will be limited to a minute, Representative <laughs> Millett. <laughs> but he can talk for longer than a minute. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. My name is John Skidmore. I'm the director of the Criminal Division for the State of Alaska Department of Law. The recommendations that I'm going to be referencing are found in the uh, Criminal Justice Commission's report Appendix F found on page F1 is where it starts. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to sort of just walk through each recommendation and tell you um, the status of that recommendation in terms of the legislation that you have in front of you today. The first recommendation talks about returning violation of conditions or release to a misdemeanor status with up to five days in jail. That is found in SB 54 as it sits in front of you all. If uh, anyone wants to know the sections that those are in, I can go back and do that, get to that detail. I won't do that unless asked, however. Recommendation number two talks about increased penalties for theft for offenders. And in looking at that, it talks about having a maximum of uh, five days suspended uh, for a third or subsequent offense was the recommendation that came out of the commission. Um, and the, excuse me, I'm sorry, the recommendation is found on page F3 where it says the commission therefore recommends for a third time theft for offenders that the offense should be punishable by up to 10 days in jail and it's, uh, I think, five days for second time offenders. Again, that general concept of increasing penalties for repeat theft offenders is currently found in SB 54 as well. If I move on to recommendation number three, that talks about allowing municipalities to set different incarceration punishments for non-criminal offenses that have state equivalents. Uh, I don't recall if that's still currently in 54 or not. I can tell you that that was in SB 55, which was actually passed this last session and has now been signed into law. So that one's already taken care of. So whether it's in 54 as a duplicate of 55, it's in 55 and passed. That's correct. Okay. And then recommendation number four talks about revising sex trafficking statutes um, and it lays out the uh, way in which that would attempted to be done. Um, this is found in 54. Um, recommendation five talks about Class C felonies, uh, changing the presumptive range for Class C felonies. The commission uh, recommended it be zero to 90 days. Uh, I think you all may have heard the Attorney General say this at other times, that recommendation from the Commission was a, um, a split vote, um, and I think there was a one vote difference. What's currently found in 54 is not zero to 90 days, it's zero to 365 days. That's the way it's listed in 54 at the moment. I'm then going to turn to recommendation number six, which is on page F5. Recommendation six talks about enact an aggravator for Class A misdemeanors for defendants uh, who have prior conviction for similar conduct. This recommendation is also found in SB 54 currently. Um, I will tell you that this recommendation came out before a, a Court of Appeals opinion that changed the landscape a little bit on it, but this recommendation is found in 54. Um, recommendation number seven, clarify that ASAP is available for minor consuming alcohol cases. Again, uh, a change to the ASAP requirements is found in SB 54 as it sits in front of you all today. 
and recommendation number eight, enact a provision requiring mandatory probation for sex offenders um, be returned to the law that is also found in SB 54 as it sits in front of you today. I'm then turning to page F7, recommendation nine, clarify the length of probation allowed for a theft for. Uh, I believe that that is also addressed in SB 54. Recommendation 10, require victim notification uh, only if practical. And give me just a moment. I know that that was addressed. I don't recall if it was 54 or 55. I think it's 55, so let me confirm that. I have a question on that. We'll take up questions at the conclusion. Yes, that recommendation, recommendation number 10, was actually found in SB 55, and so that has now been passed and is a part of law. Recommendation number 11, felony DUI uh, sentencing provisions should be in one statute. Um, that is found in SB 54 as it sits in front of you. And then I'm turning to recommendation number 12, clarify who will be assessed by pretrial services. And that is also in SB 54 sitting in front of you today. Recommendation 13, which was fixing a drafting error regarding victim notification. Uh, that was actually placed in SB 55. So it's not in 54, it was in 55. And that is now already a matter of law. I'm on page F8 with that last recommendation 13 as well as recommendation 14. Enact the following technical correction to SB 91. Um, and this one dealt with uh, inflation adjustments for class B felonies. So not all inflation adjustings, just those for class B felonies. And that was in SB 55 and that is now a matter of law. Um, and there are several um, technical corrections to SB 91, so let me do them in the, in the bullets uh, that they are found. And that first bullet deals with the um, <coughs> adjustment, uh, excuse me, inflation adjustment for Class B felonies. That was in 55. The next one talks about the commission recommends that the crime of driving without a valid license be reduced to an infraction. Uh, I believe that that is in SB 54. Um, the next bullet talks about the commission recommends deleting the reference to um, B in 1171-060. Uh, this was a, a technical correction that was found in SB 55 and has been passed into law. The next bullet, now I'm on the pa top of page F9. The commission recommends enacting the following changes regarding suspended entry of judgments. Um, this was just cleaning up some of the language that was found there to make it clear that it was a um, person charged with instead of convicted of, since SEJs don't result in a conviction if they are successfully completed. Those adjustments were also found in SB 55, not in SB 54. The next uh, bullet talks about um, Aligning the penalties for posting and sending explicit images to a minor. That is currently in SB 54, which is in front of you. And then the last, is it the last bullet? The next bullet is the commission recommends adding the following language to SB 91. And um, this is dealing with the uh, probation terms. Um, this uh, particular bullet was found in SB 55 and is already law. The next bullet is that the commission recommends following the language in section 164, page 105, referring back to SB 91, line 7. Uh, it talks about um, adding language uh, so that the data on earned compliance credits uh, would extend to the requirement for parolees, not just probationers. That was also in 55. That's not in 54, so that is already law. And then the, the last, you know, this, these bullets are sort of broken down into 
a dark bullet, a light bullet, another dark bullet, and then another light bullet, but it's all under one subsection. Um, and what it talks about is the commission amends, again, referring to sections from SB 91, section 148 and 150 of 91 for clarity as to their applicability. Um, and those adjustments were actually made in SB 55, and so they are not found in SB 54. And I think Representative Millett, you had a question? Yeah. So going back to administrative parole for a second, um, so a victim who has a right of, to notice to object to administrative parole, do they get notified when someone's up for administrative parole under SB 91? So how is a victim supposed to know um, when someone's using administrative parole if there's no victim notification? So you're asking me a question about SB 91, and if you give me just one moment, I have a different binder that answers all those sorts of questions, and I want to make sure that I answer your question correctly. So give me just one moment, please. Sure. And Representative Millett, just so that we're all in the same place, which is the which recommendation is that? The, so it's under recommendation 13, and it's on page F8, and it just talks about the um, victim notification and talks okay. about administrative parole, but it brings up a question about. Under administrative parole, I don't think there's recommend. Okay. There's no. I just want to know which yeah. recommendation. Yeah. That that helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're looking at recommendation 13, and your question for me is specifically about victim notification as it relates to administrative parole. Yes. And I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to repeat part of it because I want to make sure I have it correct in my okay. head. So <clears throat> it says here that um, a victim has a right to notice under this section may request a hearing before the prisoner. How, um, before the prisoner is released from administrative parole, how are we notifying the victim that this, this person is up for administrative parole? Because my understanding of administrative parole, there's no requirement to notify the victim. Um, so someone would just have to be very diligent, a victim would have to be, where we could notify the victim on other parole, they have the opportunity to stand before the parole board and talk, administrative hearing, it's... Um, well, I think the question, and part of what Representative Millett's asking is that they, currently for the other forms of parole, there is a requirement of victim notification that was added into, that was part of Senate Bill 91, and so I think the question is, does that same notice requirement apply to administrative parole as to the other forms of parole? No, actually, I just want to know if there's victim notification under administrative parole, and if there's not, then what is this? The, what does this do? And so th there is supposed to be a victim notification for um, administrative parole. The the victim should have the opportunity to be notified that when someone is going to be paroled. That's the concept in SB 91 that says an administrative parole would move forward unless a victim objected and asked for a hearing. So they do need to be um, notified. If you're asking me the mechanics of how that would occur, I apologize. I don't know the mechanics that DOC would currently be using to accomplish that. Okay. Um, another question. Follow up, Representative. This Moore. is a new subject. Can municipalities have um, their um, own misdemeanors to respond to local problems? Through the chair, Representative Millett, one of the the, the the quick answer is yes. However, criminal justice reform, uh, when it passed, limited what a municipality could do. Uh, in that it required any punishment for a misdemeanor to be aligned with the maximum punishment, um, that is, couldn't exceed the maximum punishment that state law would authorize. So to give you an example, let's take a DUI, for example. Um, a, a maximum penalty that would be authorized um, would be up to a year for a DUI, but for a first DUI, under criminal justice reform, it was zero to 30 days. The municipality can also enact a municipal ordinance that would make it illegal to drive under the influence of alcohol, but the punishment for that could not exceed what was authorized in state law. Um, what happened, and the reason you had the recommendation that was passed in SB 55, um, one of the recommendations in here was that there were courts that had it interpreted the provision in that criminal justice reform to apply to infractions and not just crimes. So a uh, speeding ticket, for instance. Yeah. And the intent had been that 
the limitation was supposed to be on criminal offenses, not infractions, and that's what was clarified in SB 55, and that was the recommendation that had come from the commission. Okay. And just one follow-up. Representative so Millett. On your, in your memo after SB 91 passed, you talked about administrative parole. Um, it allows certain individuals to automatically be released. So how would, how would victim, I just, I'm really concerned about the victim notification as it, as it pertains to administrative parole, because if they're automatically released under administrative parole, um, I, I don't see an, I don't see an avenue for victims to be notified, and that, that's my problem with administrative parole. We just made up administrative parole. I mean, it's just a new issue, you know. It's, for me, it's, it's, um, you know, we have a new type, we have geriatric patrol, um, parole, but just curious to reconcile what you said after, in your G June 17th memo, and now that you say that there has to be a way for victims to be notified under administrative parole. Through the chair, Representative Millett, I'm not sure which page of the memo you're looking at, but I would page want to. Two. Okay, um, what I'd like to do, uh, page two would have been sort of the executive summary that was trying to describe things generically. What I'd like to do is turn your attention to page 19 and 20 of that same memorandum. M mine actually says can, it's dated. Can you just remind us of which the memorandum and the date of the memorandum? Absolutely. <laughs> so it's actually June 16th. This is the bill review letter. Um, people refer to it as a memorandum. I, I call it a bi uh, bill review letter, what we always have to prepare for. June 16? June 16th of 2016. I have a June 17 of 2016. <laughs> okay. I, sorry, mine says 16. Okay, well, it's both disadvantaged. And, and, and so if you look at page 19 of 28, at the bottom of that page, you Which should, page? page 19 of 28, you should have administrative parole under sections 120 and 122. Oh, everybody with me? Uh -huh. No, I don't have a copy. Okay. I don't either. So. Um, when you turn to page 20, the last paragraph says, um, and, and again, we're talking about administrative parole. I've described administrative parole, and then it the, goes on to say, a victim in a case may request a hearing uh, in a case where an inmate would otherwise be eligible for administrative uh, parole, the request would result in a hearing by the parole board to determine if the inmate should be released. And that's what I was referring to when I answered your question a moment ago, is that there is a requirement in the law that the victims can object, and that would require that there be victim notification. So I can give you that interpretation of the law. If you're asking me specifically how victim notification occurs, uh, I'm afraid I'm not in the Department of Corrections, so okay. I can't answer that question. Nope, I'll save it for them. Thank you. Representative Ledoux. Yes, um, Ms. Excuse me, Mr. Skidmore. Thank you for being here today. Um, have you had the opportunity to read an opinion piece called "SB 91 Isn't Working: Serious Amendments uh, Needed," written by um, the various police chiefs all around the state in the Anchorage, Alaska Dispatch? I think the author is the known police chief who's the president of the Association of yes. Police Chiefs. And it was in Sundays, this Sunday, which would be the 22nd of, what month are we? October. October, yes. Through the chair, Representative Ledoux, I have read. The so um, does SB 54 uh, adopt the recommendations made by those uh, that police chief along with the others who are apparently concurring? Through the chair, Representative Ledoux, the first recommendation made at the end of that piece is to adopt SB 54. Um, there are additional recommendations that they describe, but the first and foremost is to adopt 54. Well, actually, it's the first. I'm not necessarily sure that it's the, the foremost, but it is the first. Um, what's your reactions to the others? Through the chair, Representative Ledoux, my reaction is that there are a number of things that they talk about doing. Some require statutory changes, some are not. Um, and I would tell you that I just had an opportunity to read it on Sunday, and so I haven't come to a final policy analysis of the rest of recommendations that they make there. When would you be able to do so? Through the chair, Representative Ledoux, um, 
coming to a policy analysis on any sort of amendment is um, not a process that the Department of Law takes lightly. Um, it's not the sort of thing that I sort of sit down and with myself and come up with what I think it should be and then I say, here's what it is and it's John Skidmore's opinion. That's not how the Department of Law analyzes policy. I'm fortunate that I work in a department with many um, very smart, many of them smarter than me and talented individuals and so we have a process where we consult with other lawyers, um, right, the idea two heads are better than one. We don't go to two, we go to more than that. And we have lots of people analyze and look at things before the department comes out with any sort of policy position. I can tell you that this week, the vast majority of the criminal division is all at a conference together uh, focusing on trial advocacy. So before I ever have an opportunity to come up with any sort of policy analysis uh, would take me several weeks probably at this point. So. Follow up? Yeah, follow up. So. None of these suggestions were bandied about or perhaps thought of previous to this article by the Department of Law? Through the chair, Representative Ledoux, um, though I know Mr. Papsador, uh, I, I know him quite well, um, uh, I, I can't tell you that I spoke with him about this uh, article before he wrote it. I have not consulted with him about the ideas that are in the article. Um, and so, there are some suggestions that um, I, I wouldn't say are new or novel, but I would have to look at each one of his suggestions carefully. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. If you wanted me to talk about a particular recommendation, I would want to look at that recommendation um, to, to answer it one-on-one. -on -one. But overall, the, the group of them, uh, no, I have not spoken with Mr. Papsidor prior to the um, article being published. Um, All of yeah, I was wondering whether we might be able to take a couple minute break and uh, allow Mr. Skidmore the option of looking over the recommendations. Um, Representative Ledoux, I, we're going to have a lunch break at noon anyway, so, and I know that the Department of Law will not be leaving us as we go <laughs> forward today, so I, I'm not going to take a break now, but he's certainly welcome. We can take that up probably after lunch. Um, Representative Fansler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, through the chair. Uh, so we just went over 14 recommendations with some subparts. Is, is that correct? Through the chair, Representative Fans, whether that's correct. And this is by our Criminal Justice Commission, uh, our various experts from around the state that have considered this for a good long time. Through the chair, it, these are the recommendations that came from that commission, yes. And, and, and of the 14 recommendations, Every one of them has been touched upon in some way, shape, or form via either the already passed SB 55 or the currently pending version of SB 54. I'm just consulting for one moment. I believe that's correct, but give me just one moment. I want to confirm that. Through the chair, Representative Fansler, that is correct. And follow up. Representative Fansler. In, in fact, SB 54 goes further than the recommendations, especially recommendation five, in which the commission that has spent a year or more reviewing this said a zero to 90 day presumptive sentencing range would be correct, and 54 says one year, correct? Through the chair, Representative Fansler, recommendation number five talks about Class C felonies. Uh, I can tell you that that was um, significantly debated at the commission, and I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember there was a one vote difference between adopting 90 days to one year. You are correct that the ultimate recommendation that came out was 90 days. You are correct that SB 54, as it sits in front of you, talks about it being zero to a year. Um, but there were there was significant uh, support on the commission for that year as well, though not the majority. So this was the recommendation that came out. You are correct about that. Thank you. Representative Millett. Thank you. Um, Mr. Skidmore, can I have you look at page, the executive summary, um, I guess it's page five. We're looking at the criminal justice. Mm -hmm. We're still in the criminal justice. Commission. So the average daily prison population I look at this and I see that even before the passage of SB 91, our prison population was decreasing at a pretty 
robust rate. Um, do you think we were on a downward trend on prison population prior to SB 91? So through the chair, I'm looking at the Alaska Criminal Justice Commission annual report dated October 27th of 2017. And I assume you're asking me about figure number one, which is the average daily prison population? Correct. So I'm, I'm just reading the chart, but in reading the chart, what it looks to me is that in 2015, the, according to the chart, the prison population started on a downward trajectory uh, below what was the projected ADP, which stands for the average daily prison population. And I believe that line is, yeah, it says implementation in July of 2016 is supposed to represent where 91 was. So it looks as though the prison population began to decrease, uh, according to that chart, prior to 91. I, I'm, I'm just reading the chart, though. And just to follow up, can you? Representative Millet. From the Department of Law, what do you think started that downward trend prior to SB 91? Were there things that were done internally in Department of Law, in Department of Corrections, in the court system that we had done that wasn't necessarily statutory that um, provided that downward trend to begin? Through the chair, Representative Millett, the reason I pause is I'm trying to think back to that time to think about what might have been the things that were going on at that time. Um, and I don't know that I have a, a definitive answer. I'm not in the Department of Corrections. I can't tell you precisely what was causing those things. Um, I do know that the Department of Corrections had begun efforts prior to 91 being implemented that was um, focused on the types of things that were in 91, the same sort of concepts. Um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think this report actually talks about that a little bit too, um, though not in the executive summary. I think they talk about it later on, which is where I think I'm getting this from. Um, I find it on page 10 of that same report. Um, prison population has changed. Um, and in looking at that report, I mean, I, I think it acknowledges that there were some of these things that were trying to be implemented by the Department of Corrections prior to the implementation of 91. I, I, I think that's what the conclusion of the report is about why it happened. Um, from the Department of Law's perspective, I don't think we had changed. The only thing that I can think that we changed around that time, and I apologize for pausing again, the only thing I can think of that we changed around that time frame is we started trying to utilize pretrial diversion to a greater degree. Um, I, I know.